On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, the Tesla community's resident white hat hacker got his hands on an autopilot hardware for computer, and it has answered many of our biggest burning questions about the upcoming sensor suite change. Plus, Tesla partners up with the U.S. government to open up some of the supercharger network to other EVs. The Model 3 and the Model Y dominated California's new car sales in 2022 and more. Greetings, friends. I'm Ryan McCaffrey here with you alongside Daisy the Boxer. To my left, it is episode 394 of Ride the Lightning, your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast for February 19th, 2023. First of all, I want to say that I hope all of you enjoyed the Sandy Monroe interview last week. I got a lot of nice, kind words about that. Although one thing I do need to note about that interview I'm pretty sure Sandy was mistaken about there being fully driverless, autonomous Cybertruck betas running around, Uh, but I didn't want to be rude in the middle of the interview. I mean, it it flagged in my brain right away, but I I just thought, you know what, we'll just we'll just keep talking and I'll just follow up with this later. Um, I don't think there's any evidence to that so far. All of the sightings that have been happening lately have been with a driver in the driver's seat. But anyway, just wanted to point that out. Also, uh, I barely got last week's episode out before Tesla tweaked the Model 3 and Model Y prices again. So here's where we currently stand as of me recording this on Friday evening. The base Model 3 was slashed by another $500, bringing it down to $43,000. The Model Y performance went up by $500 to now $59,000. And the off-menu Model Y standard range all-wheel drive, in other words, the Texas-built Model Y 2.0 as I refer to it, that one remains, in my humble opinion, not a great buy at $52,000, just $3,000 less than the long-range Model Y that gets a full 50 more miles of range. Let me say... Congratulations to all of you who got Model Y orders in at the low point here a couple of weeks ago while it was $53,000. It's, you know, it's not too far above that now, but 53 is our is our very brief low point for the last couple years at this stage. Also, congrats to all of you who decide to order a base Model 3 now at this price. Because combined with the $7,500 tax credit for those who qualify, the base Model 3 is now a better deal than ever at $35,500. Now, there has, of course, been a $35,000 Model 3 before, but this one today is a much better value. The one from 2019, the original standard Model 3, standard range Model 3, was a 220 mile range car, which charged to the 80 to 90 percent that you would keep that car at every day, meant under 200 miles of daily usable range, and it had a partial premium interior. The Model 3 that you get for that same money today is quite a lot better. 272 miles of non-degrading LFP battery range that you can charge to 100% every day. It's also got a heat pump in there. It's got a lithium-ion 12-volt accessories battery that you're not going to have to worry about every couple of years. It's got a power rear lift gate and a whole bunch more. So the base Model 3 today is an incredible value relative to any Tesla that has ever been made to date. One more quick note on the subject of prices. A few episodes ago, I mentioned the new owner loyalty, excuse me, ownership loyalty program in which Tesla was offering existing Model S and Model X owners an incentive to try and get them to upgrade to a new S or an X. Well, Tesla has just upped that incentive. A tip of the hat here goes to eagle-eyed Tesla insider Sawyer Merritt, who spotted this on the Tesla website. Current Tesla Model S or Model X owners 
with active unlimited free supercharging are now eligible for an additional $5,000 toward their trade-in value. To qualify, owners must trade in their Model S or X with unlimited free supercharging and purchase a new Model S or X. Now, as a Twitter user commented in response on Sawyer's post, $5,000 looks to be roughly 57,000 supercharging miles if you're using 25 cents a kilowatt hour, or for those of you out west with me in California, about 41,000 supercharging miles at peak California supercharging rates. So an extra $5,000, you know, that might not necessarily convince anybody who's not been thinking about upgrading already, but it stands a pretty good chance, I'd say, of nudging any fence sitters over to try to go ahead and place a new order. I mean, I guess Tesla just wants to get rid of free supercharging, get more of those cars off the road, and also simultaneously just get some new S's and X's sold. Uh, Before I move on with the rest of this week's proper news, that was just the warm-up section, I do a note that I hope all of you who are backing me on Patreon at that $10 a month ludicrous tier or higher enjoyed this week's lightning round bonus mini episode, which was about the top five non-Tesla EVs that I would love to drive someday that I haven't yet had the privilege of. And as a reminder, you can voluntarily choose to support this podcast. That is, this is a listener-supported podcast. Listener-supported, also the name of one of my favorite Dave Matthews Band live albums. This podcast is also listener-supported. That is how it survives So if at some point you say, hey, you know what, Ryan, I've been enjoying your podcast for quite a while. I'm going to support you on Patreon. You can do that on my Patreon page found at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. And that reminder that the annual pledges, you can, the normal way is to just pledge monthly, but you can do an annual pledge, just pay once for an entire year's worth of support. And if you do that, you will get a 10% discount on doing so. All right, let's talk Tesla news. There is so much of it this week. I was actually saying this at the end of the lightning round this week on Patreon, where I had probably a full show planned out by Tuesday night. That's how busy of a news week it's been. And then I had to work a lot more. There was a lot more to do the rest of the week before I got here to Friday to record, because it has just been such a crazy week of Tesla news. But no doubt the big story this week, it's actually a two-part story, and it is both parts are around Autopilot Hardware 4. So let's start with this. A good sign for the upcoming Hardware 4 rollout, and that is Hardware 4 has been approved in Europe. I saw this on Teslarati where they wrote, the approval of the new autopilot computer was listed in documents from the Dutch Vehicle Authority, RDW. The RDW documents, which were initially shared on the TFF forum, listed a number of changes to the Model S sedan and Model X SUV. The top speed of the Model S has been raised to 174 miles per hour out of the factory, which is probably from the new brakes. Though the though Tesla still listed the flagship all-electric sedan with the top speed, of 200 miles per hour with the carbon ceramic brake kit, which are yet to be made available. That's a 20K if you're curious for that one. Anyway, getting back to the news. While the European certificate did not mention specific details about Hardware 4, the RDW documents did list the change as, quote, the introduction of Generation 4 complex vehicle control system and in parentheses, autopilot, end quote. Also mentioned in the RDW documents are the, quote, introduction of new car computer and GNSS antenna, as well as the, quote, introduction of Generation 3 inverters to the drive units. So in other words, just the the new drivetrain that's on the the new S and the new X. So this, this news isn't necessarily a really big concrete step forward. Stay tuned for that. Uh, But it is a sign that things are moving. So look, I mean, we know that Hardware 4 is going into the Cybertruck, but the big question is the rest of the fleet, right? 
This approval certificate at least gives us a reasonable bit of confidence that Hardware 4 is also going to go into the lower volume Model S and Model X fairly quickly. And again, hold that thought. The bigger question is how quickly it's going to go into the rest of the fleet, meaning the high volume cars, the Model 3 and the Model Y. Now, personally, I think it's going to go into the entire fleet at virtually the same time. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, because we know from all of the various leaks and filings that Tesla has been preparing for autopilot hardware for for a long time, which means that their suppliers, including Samsung on the cameras and others, are probably ready to provide ample quantities of the parts of the hardware. And then the other reason that I think it's going to go into all five Teslas very quickly is because Tesla's not going to want to Osborne the Model 3 and Model Y. If the Cybertruck, the S, and the X get hardware 4, and there's a gap between those cars getting it and the 3 and the Y getting it, well, what's that going to do to Model 3 and Model Y orders? It's going to slow them down. Now, not for everybody. There are going to be plenty of customers that don't follow this stuff super closely like you and I do. But savvy folks like all of you listening to this podcast would probably hold off on your order if you were planning to get a 3 or a Y and you knew that Hardware 4 was that close. Quite frankly, I would wait if I knew it was that close because as we have learned from Elon, there is not going to be an upgrade path for this. So it's going to be a hard divide between having Hardware 4 and having Hardware 3, even if, as I've predicted before and will say again, that it's likely to be a good while before Hardware 4 starts getting noticeably taken advantage of in the cars in a way that is that is perceptible and tangible to the driver. The fact is, if you are planning to keep your Tesla for any length of time, you are going to want hardware for if you're planning on buying at some point between now and the end of the year. So all of that was part one. Part two is where it got better because the European approval thing that I just told you about, that happened at the very beginning of the week. In the middle of the week, this happened. Our white hat hacker friend, Green the Only, who I've mentioned on this podcast a number of times over the years, well, he got his hands on an actual Hardware 4 unit. Yes, this happened. And now, as a result, we have some key questions about Hardware 4 either answered or at least strongly hinted at. And there is good news here, namely regarding the biggest issue with the camera and sensor suite today, at least in my opinion, and I think many of you share this opinion, that it needs front bumper mounted cameras. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me take you through the highlights of the huge Twitter thread that Green did on this, which, yes, does include photographic evidence of the, st- of the, the piece, the hardware for control unit that he got his hands on. So I'm not going to give you all this because some of it is really technical that even I don't understand that I don't think is necessarily relevant to the greater conversation. And then some of it is directly tying into pictures. But here are the highlights and there are a lot of them. So bear with me for a few minutes here. So Green writes, I am sure you are all eager to know more about Hardware 4. So I am going to show you the refreshed car computer from a Model X. Just don't tell anybody you saw it because it's really a secret still. This unit made an appearance at the EPC about a month ago, but the picture was hidden. Uh, that's The EPC is regarding a, a regulatory filing with the FCC, basically. He says, looks like Tesla started to build cars with it, but does not deliver them yet. I imagine the plan is to announce on March 1st, which is the big investor day coming up at Giga Texas, that all cars off the line already have it. To start with sort of bad news, the form factor is totally different, so definitely no retrofits on this one. And I'm just going to pause Green's uh, stuff for a second to just throw in my own commentary, which is simply to say, 
I mean, Elon already told us this. Uh, he didn't say it this way, that it was a, f- a physical incompatibility. He made it more of a, you won't need this kind of thing. Like, you don't have to worry about it kind of thing. But Green putting basically any and all doubt to rest that, no, there there will be no compatibility between three and four, so no upgrades are going to happen. All right, getting back to Green's thread here. He says, now to the actual meat. Infotainment was reworked compared to current units. The GPU is now on the same board, so there's no more GPU daughter board. This makes the whole unit thinner. Otherwise, no changes there. Same 256 gigabyte NVMe drive and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Same AMD CPU and GPU. And then he starts putting up some pictures with some descriptors. Hardware 4. A lot less improvement than many hoped for. Still, It's still Samsung Exynos IP based. It bumped the CPU cores from 20, excuse me, from 12 to 20, five clusters of four cores each, maxing at 2.35 gigahertz. The number of trip cores increased from two to three with a 2.2 gigahertz maximum frequency. All of these are doubled times two since there are two system on chips per board for redundancy, which hardware three has now. Sensors, there are now 12 fully populated camera connectors. One is marked spare though, so make that 11 cameras, he says. The names are a bit cryptic, but it looks like side cameras are in the front fenders now. Rumors of two cameras in the windshield are confirmed. The cameras are F-SVC, L-SVC, R-SVC, LFF rear, RFF rear, and he's guessing, as I would, in FF means front fenders. There's selfie camera, wide, main, backup, LFF side, and RFF side. He's suggesting that perhaps the cameras have migrated from the B-pillar to the front fender, so in effect having uh, two sets of cameras in the front third of the car now. He says, what's SVC, you might wonder? According to the EPC filing, SVC is bumper, so I would guess these are bumper cameras. There's a huge blind spot up front on legacy cars, so front bumper camera and two in the rear bumper corners for cross-traffic alerts. He's, again, I should clarify, these are all educated guesses on his part. We cannot take this as total 100% confirmation as of yet, but odds are green is correct, but just, just want to caveat that. And to finish up his remarks, he says, new GPS module with a tri-band antenna. The unit itself is big and unmarked, so who makes it is unknown. I would not be surprised if it's a somewhat custom Tesla thing. They carry a bootloader for it in firmware. And then radar. Yes, there's now the bespoke Phoenix radar. Yes, of course there is. And yes, that's what it's called in the properties too, which of course he's making light of the fact that it's called Phoenix as if it, as if it rose from the ashes because of course radar went away about, a, what was it, a year and a half, two years ago. And, and now it has risen from its own ashes. Uh, he says, there's also the radar heater, of course. So thank you to Green for shedding a ton of light. Again, not the full 100% confirmation of everything, but we now have a much, much better idea of what's going on with Hardware 4. And as Patreon backer Rodman Lau wisely pointed out in the comments on this week's Patreon poll after Green's thread went up, which I'll get to that poll in a second, I, uh, this, this almost certainly explains the Model 3s that I've, that I've talked about a couple of times that have been spotted running around with the big custom front and rear black bras fitted over the front end and rear end of the cars. It, those, those bras are almost certainly covering up the new Hardware 4 autopilot cameras. I'll take a quick pause here to just go to that Patreon poll, which again, goes up every Tuesday night 
on my Patreon, and you do not have to be a Patreon backer to vote. Anybody can vote, so check in on it. Feel free to voice your your vote on patreon.com slash Podcast on each week's poll topic. And this week, I asked simply this, how important is hardware for to you? And I said, if you're planning to buy a Tesla this year, this question is especially for you. But even if, like me, you're not planning a Tesla purchase in 2023, pretend you are. Just vote as if you are. So how important is it, especially knowing that there will be no upgrade path from Hardware 3? And it's an interesting split here. 34% say, very important. I absolutely want to wait until I know I'd get Hardware 4 with an almost equal 32%, so about a third and about a third, saying, it'd be nice, but I'm not going to alter my purchasing plans for it. 19% saying, I'm indifferent and or don't plan to purchase FSD, so it's no biggie either way. And 15% saying, it's important, I'll do my best to align my purchase with Hardware 4. Thank you very much to everybody that voted in this week's Patreon poll. So, again, I am totally with Green on this in the sense that given that this is leaking now, along with the European approval that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, I totally agree that this is almost certainly going to be one of the announcements made at the Investor Day event coming up at Giga Texas in less than two weeks on March 1st. So, we're already pretty sure that the new cameras that plug into the new Hardware 4 computer are 5 megapixel, and we know that from a previous leak. So when you add it all up, at this point, we now have a pretty darn good idea of what Hardware 4 is. The only real mystery is how much more powerful the new FSD Computer 2 is. I mean, we know we've got 11 cameras, and if we let's let's try to sort that out. Two in the top of the windshield looking forwards, two on the front fenders, two on the front bumpers, two on the rear bumpers, one backup camera. That leaves two more. Oh, then there's I forgot one, the selfie camera. That'd be the cabin facing camera on the inside of the car. That's 10. So what's the last one? I guess there's at least one more mystery left to solve. Uh, One thing that should make all of you happy, or at least it makes me happy, the new cameras in new locations, and specifically where those new locations are, front bumper and rear bumper, those locations mean we should be able to get a proper 360 degree camera view on the screen when parking in hardware for cars. And if that's the case, That is a feature that many, many, many people have been wanting for a very long time. And quite frankly, it should be on cars at these price points. So let's hope that it is indeed going to happen on the new build fleet once Hardware 4 rolls out. Next up this week, the opening of the Tesla supercharger network to non-Tesla EVs in the United States is finally happening soon-ish. Tesla tweeted this from their official at Tesla charging account saying, select Tesla superchargers across the U.S. will soon be open to all EVs. Our U.S. network will more than double by the end of 2024 to support our growing Tesla fleet and new EV customers, end quote. Well, this comes on the heels of the White House announcing a new $7.5 billion initiative that set a goal of 500,000 chargers being built on American roads and highways by 2030. President Biden tweeted, quote, In building our EV charging network, we have to ensure that many char- as many chargers work for as many drivers as possible. To that end... Elon Musk will open a big part of Tesla's network up to all drivers. That's a big deal, and it'll make a big difference, end quote. To which Elon responded on Twitter to the president saying, quote, Thank you. Tesla is happy to support other EVs via our supercharging network, end quote. Now, for some context here, Reuters has more in their report. By late 2024, 
Tesla would open 7,500 superchargers to other EVs, with 3,500 of them being new and existing superchargers along highway corridors, the Biden administration said. It would also offer 4,000 slower chargers. This is in addition to the 7,500. 4,000 slower chargers at locations like hotels and restaurants. For a bit of context, Reuters adds that Tesla, quote, has 17,711 superchargers, accounting for about 60% of total U.S. fast chargers. Finally, a White House official added that, quote, Tesla does have a hardware and a software solution to allow for CCS. While I do wholeheartedly believe that Tesla would have done this anyway of their own volition as part of its long-held mission statement, there's also a financial incentive for them. Because in order to get a piece of that $7.5 billion funding to help build some of these half a million new uh, high-speed chargers, Tesla must support other cars on its supercharging network. So whether you choose to believe that Tesla is doing this for mission statement reasons or financial ones, the reality is just that it's both. Both things can be true at the same time. But regardless, it's just awesome that this is finally going to happen. Now, the big question to me is which 3,500 new and existing superchargers? Are they going to be ones in heavy usage corridors, like say Interstate 5 here in California, perhaps I-95, which runs up and down most of the East Coast, or will Tesla only do this in lower traffic areas where they think that the network can accommodate additional non-Tesla traffic? I could see it going either way. I mean, looking at it optimistically that it is gonna be along routes that people wanna drive and are driving on, One of the reasons, perhaps, that California has been getting so many of these 50, 60, 80, 100 stall superchargers either being built or upgraded here in California is to prepare for this very thing. I mean, you got to figure that Tesla's, we, we know they have, I don't know if lobbyist is the right word, but they have people whose job is to follow policy in Washington, right? And know what's coming down the pipe. So I expect that, Tesla has known that the administration, the Biden administration planned to do this and they've been able to lay the groundwork here by, I mean, the fact that they've already done this in Europe, in a number of European countries, you know, they've been getting ready for this. I don't think it's a coincidence that all of this is happening on the schedule that it's happening on. Now, personally, I would say one other note, I do expect that either all or at least the overwhelming majority of those 3,500 superchargers that were mentioned are going to have that magic dock dual cable on the supercharging stalls for that direct CCS connection. I I expect that's, those are again, it's a package deal, I have no doubt. Also, there's one other thing to consider for Tesla. This is going to open up a nice little revenue stream for them because It's not going to be free for other non-Teslas to use the superchargers, and it may not even be cheap. I mean, that's not to say I don't think Tesla is going to necessarily make it prohibitively expensive for non-Teslas, but do I think that non-Teslas are going to pay a premium for it? Yeah, I, I absolutely think that's probably going to be the case. So I am eager to see how this shakes out. Next this week, let's stay in California The Model Y and the Model 3 were California's best-selling vehicles, period, in 2022. I saw this story, ironically, on Drive Tesla Canada. I guess, you know, if Drive Drive Tesla California is not a thing, but (laughs) shout out to to Drive Tesla Canada for the write-up here. They said, according to new data published this week by the California New Car Dealers Association, the Model Y was the most popular car in California in 2022 with 87,257 new registrations from January to December. In second place was also a Tesla. The Model 3, I'll tell you, not too far behind the Y. 78,934 registrations for the Model 3 during the same time period. The performance by both the Model Y and Model 3 was more than dominant as the third place vehicle, 
The Toyota RAV4 was nearly 30,000 units behind the Model Y. The popular gas-powered SUV recorded 59,794 registrations. In fourth place, the Toyota Camry, 55,967. While taking the top two spots in the California auto market, the largest and most competitive market in the U.S., is a major accomplishment for Tesla, the company as a brand bucked the trend and recorded a 54.2% increase in registrations from 2021 to 2022. This was more than double the increase compared to that of the second place automaker, Genesis, which sells far fewer cars than Tesla does, just 56,410 across the entire country last year. Not to be left out, the Model S and Model X also had strong showings in their respective segments. For the Model S, it topped the luxury high-end sports car segment with 9,234 registrations, nearly double that of the second place in the category BMW 5 Series, which had 4,898. The Model X placed fourth in the luxury midsize SUV segment, amassing 11,273 registrations last year for a 12.3% share in the segment. Despite being in fourth place, the Model X was only 4,720 units behind the first place Lexus RX that had 15,993. With the 54.2% increase in registrations, Tesla now has an 11.2% market share in California, which as we noted before, is the largest and most competitive in the US, an impressive accomplishment for an EV only automaker. This figure is nearly double the market share that it had in California in 2021, when it held 6.5% of the overall car market in the state. Thank you to Drive Tesla Canada. So I know I just threw a bunch of numbers at you, but I thought they were all worth mentioning. And I, again, I know California is just one state, but it is a big one. And so to see Tesla take the top two, top two spots for new car sales is kind of insane, really. I mean, the Model 3, I don't know if all of you have heard this saying, but it's it's something of a common saying out here in California. The Model 3, now per the sales charts, really is the California Camry now. And the Model Y, well, I guess the California RAV4 just doesn't quite have the same alliterative roll off the tongue, does it? Maybe the the Redwood City RAV4? Could we go with that? Redwood City's up here in the Bay Area. Anyway, uh, the, the Model Y figure is likely to go up in 2023 as production grows out of Giga Texas and the fact that prices to, you know, right here early in the year have come way down. You know, even the Model S that topped its segment should keep going up because production capacity on the S should inch higher this year as well over at the Fremont factory. Now, no joke, one last thing on this that's, that's I think, worth considering. I expect Tesla's going to be leading the way on this, but they're now getting help from lots of other good electric vehicles from other companies hitting the market as well. But we're, we might be heading for a situation where we're going to functionally break California's carpool lanes pretty soon. Because as of now... EVs do get access to the carpool lane even with a single driver. If, you know, if it's, an, if it's a battery electric vehicle, you can get access. So I have to figure that the California DMV or California lawmakers or whoever it is that's tasked with setting the rules for the carpool lanes in the state, they might have to rethink those rules pretty soon with so many Teslas and so many other EVs just flooding the state. But hey, what a good problem to have, right? Uh, real quick, while we're on the subject of California, I know I do have a lot of California listeners. I know this doesn't apply to everybody, so I'll make this quick. Buyers of the Model 3 and the Model Y, I've got some good news for you if you live in California. After these recent price cuts, both the 3 and the Y are now re-eligible for a $2,000 cash rebate as part of the California Clean Vehicle Rebate Program. They had been in there for a while, but they were removed as the prices on the cars just kept going up. They're back in there now. 
which means that we can take that base Model 3 figure that I mentioned at the top of the show and shave another $2,000 off of it for eligible Californians, which means $33,500 for a base Model 3. And with the Model Y at $55,000, it brings it back to the $53,000 it was just a couple weeks ago. And then if you qualify for this full $7,500 tax credit on that, you're well under 50 k at that point too. So some nice incentives coming back online in the state of California. Finally this week, this is a fun little story. Ferrari CEO Benedetto Vigna spoke highly of Tesla in a new interview with Bloomberg. Speaking at Ferrari's Maranello headquarters, Vigna, age 53, credited Tesla with accelerating change within an industry steeped in engine cylinders. In their Q&A, they asked, what have you learned from Tesla? And Benedetto's response was, the big contribution that Tesla has made to the automotive industry, it was a wake-up call. Things used to happen too slowly. Tesla shook up the industry and accelerated processes and decisions. They were faster and more agile, end quote. Now, that is what we call game-recognizing game right there. It's nice to see a legacy automaker praise Tesla instead of throw shade at them for once. Now, in that same interview, the CEO claimed that Ferrari's first EV will be released in 2025. And so the honest question, a fair question here is, will Ferrari beat the new Tesla Roadster to market with the first EV supercar? And note, I'm not counting the Remock Nevera because that is a $2.5 million hypercar that they're only making 150 of. You'll never see it on the road. A Ferrari you might actually see. Like, I do see Ferraris from time to time. Anyway, regardless, uh, honestly, it's cool to see a company who cares so much about making cars that are built to evoke emotion from their design and from their performance and their handling embrace electrification. I'm going to be really, really curious what the Ferrari EV's range is, for starters. I mean, I expect they're going to opt for the smallest battery pack that they can get away with just to try and keep the car as light as possible. So I would definitely, you know, knowing nothing about the Ferrari EV and, you know, knowing what Tesla told us five years ago about the Roadster, I doubt that the Ferrari EV is going to challenge Tesla's stated range of 620 miles, a.k.a. 1,000 kilometers, on the new Roadster. But Ferrari is going to have to get one thing right that they've never really had to worry about in their history before, or at least up until extraordinarily recently. The software and the UI. I watched a Throttle House video. It's a great YouTube channel, car YouTube channel. I really like the the two guys that host it. Give it a look if you're curious. I watched a Throttle House video of the Ferrari Roma recently. And they basically, in their review, they said the car is beautiful, it drives great, but that the software and the UI are bad. Not just like mediocre, like but actually bad. So... This is an expertise software that Ferrari has not yet shown. Now, I'm rooting for them, to be clear. Even if most of us will never be able to afford a Ferrari, I think having more aspirational EVs is a good thing, particularly with kids, you know, the next generation. Because when I think back to my childhood, I had an exotic car poster on my wall for years as a kid. It had a little just said exotic cars in the middle of it. And it had, in each corner, it had four pictures of four cars, one in each corner. It was a Testarossa, a Countach, a 911. And I actually can't remember now what the fourth car was on that poster, but I used to just stare at that poster. And I, and I just, was, it, it was very aspirational, right? Like I was like, oh man, it'd be so cool. And that that helped me get into cars, right? That, that only helped feed that. That's, I think, what supercars can do. So, Bring on the Ferrari EV and Tesla, Franz, Elon, if you're listening. Bring on the new Tesla Roadster, please. All right, that wraps it up for this week's busy 
week of Tesla news. Stick with me, though. I've got some excellent Ride the Lightning Hotline phone calls from all of you guys lined up and ready to go right after this. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. Welcome to the Ride the Lightning Hotline. It is your chance to call in and be a part of the podcast. There are two easy ways to call in. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software. Please try to keep your question to 90 seconds or less. Record it. Email it to me at teslapodcast at gmail.com. And the other option is to simply take that same 90 second or less question and call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's a toll free number you can dial anytime, day or night. And that number is 1 888 989 8752. Again, that's 1 888 989 TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Let's kick it off with our friend Dave, aka the Tesla Barbarian. Ryan, my brother, it's your friend, the Tesla Barbarian. I had a quick comment to make about something you said on last week's podcast. You were talking about the Tesla incentive program where you trade in your current Tesla and you get either $3,000 off of an S or an X or you get free supercharging. And you were theorizing that it might be primarily to prevent people from looking around at maybe a Lucid or a Rivian, looking at something other than a Tesla. But I think it might be something closer to home. You see, the Cybertruck is impending for production, and the Cybertruck objectively is a better value proposition in many ways than the S or the X. The S and the X already don't make up a huge cross-section of the number of vehicles that Tesla sells every year, and both Elon and Franz have said at different times that they're still making S and X mostly for sentimental reasons. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely still attached to the S and the X, and I don't want to see them go anywhere. The S is the flagship, and the X, well, come on, Falcon wing doors. Come on, guys. But the fact is that even me, I, I, as an example, I have two friends, both of whom, for them, money is no object. And of course, what is the guy who can buy any car buy for his car. He gets a a Tesla. Each of them own two Teslas, and both of them have told me separately at different times that they're both going to be replacing their current Teslas with Cybertrucks. One of them has an S and X, the other one has an X and a Y, and both of them are replacing both of their current Teslas with Cybertrucks. Why? Because of the value proposition. The ruggedness of the vehicle, the fact that it can hold up to anything, the stainless steel construction, etc., 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 it doesn't make any sense to buy an S or an X for them because the functionality of the Cybertruck and the value is just better. Even if the Cybertruck goes north of $100,000 with six seats and stainless steel construction and it's indestructible, including the glass to a certain extent, it just makes more sense for them to buy a Cybertruck. So I think Tesla might be taking some steps to preempt their own Osborne effect when the Cybertruck goes into mass production to keep people looking at their S and their X as a viable option for purchase as opposed to everybody just defaulting to hopping on the waiting list for the Cybertruck. Anyway, those are my thoughts, Ryan. Good talking to you, and I'm really looking forward to next week's podcast. Hopefully, you do get to land that Sandy Monroe interview. Thank you. Great point, my friend. You make a great argument here, and I'll tell you, I can't argue against it. We saw this once before when the Model 3 was first rolling out, right? That was back when the Model S was, at that point in time, arguably not a great value by comparison. Again, just in that window of time. The 3 was 310 miles a range, which actually turned out to be 330 miles of range. As you remember, Tesla eventually revised the EPA mileage rating on the rear-wheel drive long-range Model 3, while again, at that point in time, the $70,000 plus base 75D Model S was something like 260 miles of range, yes, less range than the Model 3 for more money, and the 100D Model S was 330 miles of range, but a lot more money than the Model 3. And in fact, Model S sales did slow down there for a while as a result until Tesla was able to turn its attention back to the Model S, improve the car, revise the car, bump up its range again before, of course, eventually leading to the the new Model S and Model X 
that we got in the summer of 2021. So yes, the Cybertruck could be, for a short time, Tesla's own worst enemy in at least some small way. Good theory here, and thank you for your call. Oh, and uh, I hope you did enjoy that Sandy Monroe interview last week. Next up is Brian from Missouri. Hi, this is Brian from Missouri. Uh, I've got a two-part question. Uh, first one, uh, with Hardware 4 uh, coming out, when do you think it's going to get released and uh, put out in both the Model 3 and the Model Y? Um, and the second part of my question, uh, I've got a Model 3 on order, um, you know, with uh, some of the sensors and radar being removed recently, um, and then Hardware 4 coming out. Uh, what's your thoughts? Should I wait for Hardware 4 to release? Um, should I just take um, delivery of my Model 3 now, uh, sometime here in the month of February, before um, the IRS updates their uh, how they're going to enforce the taxes with um, all the battery components? So I uh, would love to hear your opinion. Thanks. Hey, Brian. Well, I'm happy to give you the best advice that I can here. I trust you've already been listening very intently uh, with with personal interest to that front part of the show where I talked extensively about hardware for. Now, I, of course, don't know your financial situation or any other details about you. So what I'm about to say to you is very much in an in a vacuum kind of scenario. But with that being said, if you can wait a little while longer for the car, I would absolutely wait for hardware for I recognize that there's a very good chance that you'll potentially lose out on half of that seventy five hundred dollar tax credit by doing so because the IRS may very well, and in fact likely is going to be detailing those battery sourcing requirements for the tax credit, and then of course, enforcing them. But I personally think, again, hardware four is worth waiting for, and it's worth paying an additional $3,750 for, particularly now that we have confirmation of what I had suspected all along, that Tesla's not gonna be doing any upgrades or retrofits for hardware three cars. You know, it's a long-term thing in fairness, because as I said, history suggests that the end user is likely to see, or it's likely to be a while before the real world user sees any tangible benefit from hardware four for a while. But again, I'll just echo what I said earlier. If you plan to keep the car for just a few years, like it's like a short-term lease thing, then feel free to disregard what I'm saying take delivery of what you ordered, enjoy it. But if this is a longer term purchase for you, I would go for that hardware for model three if you can. Good luck and thanks for your call. Next up is Mel from North Carolina. Hi, Ryan, this is Mel Tassin out of uh, North Carolina. I've got a model three standard range plus from 2019. I do have the full self driving uh, packet and just recently heard uh, Elon mention that um, the full self-driving will be, um, I guess your hands-free will be increased if you get 10,000 miles driven on full self-driving. Uh, I really don't know how to reach out and, and push this out other than calling you, but I'm curious to know if in this next update or if this question is already asked, but is there something that will show us, the driver, how much miles we have driven in full self-driving so we're aware of how close to that 10,000 mile mark we are? Uh, if there's not, I think it's highly recommended that Tesla create something like that, some sort of visual to allow its drivers to see where they are in that uh, 10,000 mile full self-driving journey. Um, I'm hoping that I'm fairly close, but uh, yeah, it's just one thing that I, I don't know. I've got about 77,000 miles on my car, um, and I have no idea how much of that is driven in full self-driving. Thanks a lot. Bye. Hi, Mel. I agree that it makes all the sense in the world to show you how many FSD beta miles you've driven. Not only would it be good customer service to do that, but it would also probably drive more FSD beta usage as people try to get their number up to that 10,000 mile threshold, which certainly then serves Tesla's interest to get more people using the beta. So we'll see. 
Although, there's a couple things here. One, again, I hate to be pessimistic, but I do not have my hopes up that NHTSA is going to allow that steering wheel nag to be eliminated at all. And then number two, there was a little story this week. NHTSA did in fact issue a quote unquote, using like the largest air quotes ever here, they issued a recall on all of the FSD beta vehicles to uh, have Tesla change some behaviors of the beta, including some yellow light intersection stuff and a couple of other things. I didn't have time to get into it earlier in the podcast, but kind of want to see where that shakes out too. That could throw a wrench into the whole timing of this anyway. In fact, it could throw a wrench into version 11.3 that we've been waiting on. So uh, we're that's that all remains to be seen. But for now, I'd certainly agree with your idea on this. So thank you for your call. One more caller this week. It's Rafa from South Florida. Hey, Ryan, it's Rafa here from South Florida. Longtime listener. Appreciate everything that you do for the community. Listen, I have a quick question for the community and hopefully for someone at Tesla. Uh, for multi-Tesla homeowners, so we have a Model 3 and a Model Y. One of the coolest features from my point of view is being able to share an address from your Apple Maps or Google Maps directly to the car's navigation. Now, if I get into my wife's car and in the app itself, the driver profile is linked to my Model 3, the address actually gets sent to my Model 3, which I'm not driving it. If the car is smart enough to know that I'm the one in the driver's seat and it's set my seat you know, to my positioning and my climate control based on my iPhone, shouldn't the car be smart enough to know that if I'm about to share an address, shouldn't it share to the car that's being in use? It's kind of frustrating because I have to go back to the app, switch the profile back to my wife's car, and then reshare the address. So maybe there's a workaround that the community is aware of, but I thought I'll pass the question over to you. Again, appreciate all you do. Thank you so much. Hey, Rafa. Well, I've said this before, but it's especially true now that the Model Y just got such a huge price drop. We are going to be seeing a lot more multi-Tesla households in the near future. And as such, I think your suggestion's a very valuable one. Hopefully it's not too much trouble for the Tesla software team to connect those few extra dots in order to get the address shared to the desired car. I mean, hey, I'm happy to put this out there in the hopes that the right folks at Tesla hear it. Thank you for your call and for the great suggestion. Thanks to everybody that took the time to call in. If I didn't get to you, I'll do my best to get to you next week. I've got plenty more calls still lined up and ready to go, but keep them coming. I'd love to hear your new calls, your new questions, comments, and discussion topics around anything in the world of Tesla. But I'm not done. Stick with me. I've got some more podcasts for you coming up right after this. Well, the big update in my Tesla journey this week is not Tesla specific, but it's Tesla ecosystem. And that is my solar was finally activated. I am now generating power from the sun. My solar is on. However, I have to say, I'm a bit unsure of how to best utilize it. And I'm not sure anybody really explains these kind of little finer things to you. So... I want to ask all of you who are already living with solar a few questions. Number one, is there a way to tell my Tesla app that I have solar when it's a non-Tesla solar panels? Is that even possible for a non-Tesla solar system? So that's question number one. Like I, I can mean I can at least see when it's feeding energy back into the grid and, and when it's pulling energy from the grid, like right now. You know, it's it's taking a little bit of energy from the grid because the sun's down. But that's so that's number one. Number two, here's a, here's a bigger question for all of you: How should I configure my power wall? Because from I've been poking around in there a lot. It seems like I have to go to manually go in and set the peak times, the the peak power times myself to just be when the sun isn't out, because if I set those to the peak hours, 
it seems like that will flip the power wall on at those times. So I basically got it set to where peak usage is at at night. Uh, so then it goes to power wall. So is there a better way to do this that I'm missing? Because I feel like there probably is. Question number three for all of you solar veterans. Should I charge my car in the middle of the day now or not worry about it because of net metering? So that that's a big question I have because, you know, I, I am still on a, a rate plan, the EV rate plan on my utility provider, PG&E. And so the peak electricity rates are still much higher than the off-peak ones. So should I still charge off-peak even though the sun's not out? So I'm not quite sure, you know, how to do that. And then the other part two of that is, should I lower the charge? If I should, if I, if it would be good to charge during the day while the sun is out, should I lower the charging rate from my Tesla wall connector so that it doesn't exceed, so that the amount of power it's drawing doesn't exceed the solar output. In other words, so, because if I just plug it in at the full, I think it's what, 48 amps, it'll, you know, that's more, that's going to put more juice into the car than the sun can put into my panels and, and thus into my house at a given time. And then the fourth and final question I have, at least for now here as I'm at the beginning of this journey should I stick with that EV rate plan with my utility provider, which of course has the lowest electricity rates overnight and the highest ones during the day? I mean, it, it seems like I should, right? Like the lowest rates at night, higher rates during the day when solar's doing its thing. But curious to hear about that. So it, you don't have to call in with this. Um, I know this is pretty, these are pretty specific questions and maybe this is a topic that as I learn more about it, and, and feel more comfortable and kind of get a little bit of a mastery around it. I could do a, uh, a lightning round weekly bonus mini episode on this for Patreon. But right now, I'm still learning. I'm still gathering information. And I would love your help for those of you that are veterans of the solar experience. So please feel free to email me if you think you can help me out. Teslapodcast at gmail.com. Pro tip of the week time. Tim from Indiana. Go ahead. Hi, Ryan. This is Tim from the land of roundabouts near Indianapolis. I have a pro tip for you. When charging and eating dinner, it sure would be nice to know how many stations are in use. I wish the phone app would display the same information that we can get on our Tesla screen. Until they add this feature, my pro tip is to use your Sentry camera. If I park in the middle station, I can get an idea of how many other cars there are by viewing the left and right side pillar cameras. When I'm the only car charging in a 12 charger station, it sure is nice to know that I have time to order dessert. Thanks for the podcast. Have a great new year. Thank you, Tim. Well, if you open the Tesla app and tap location, it should show you the nearby chargers, including how many are in use at the bottom of the screen. So I think this fulfills your request, but regardless, using the live feed cameras on sentry mode, as you suggest, is a good way to at least be able to see if there's anybody on either side of you. Thank you for the call. And anybody else that has a pro tip of the week that you'd like to share with me and your fellow Tesla owners and enthusiasts, please send it in the same way that you send in the regular Ride the Lightning hotline calls. I told you about that earlier in the podcast. Before I go, let me mention some friends of the podcast that can perhaps be of use to you. Starting with abstractocean.com, makers of many an excellent aftermarket Tesla accessory for the S, for the 3, for the X, and for the Y, for all of them. Check it out, abstractocean.com. Use the coupon code RTLPODCAST at checkout to get 15% off of your first order. Pile everything you like in there and use that coupon code RTL podcast, no space in there at all. Thank you very much to Abstract Ocean for continuing to extend that discount offer to my audience. And then the snap plate, which you can get at everyamp.com slash RTL. That, as I always remind you, is the front license plate bracket for people like me that hate having to put a front license plate on. This thing has a nice minimal design. 
There's no sticking. There's no permanent, there's no screwing, like drilling holes into anything. It will mount up there nice and clean, but you can take it completely off and it'll be like it was never there as well. Use it if you're going to be at a uh, parking meter, if you're going to be going through a toll booth or over a bridge, it can be of, of great use to you. Uh, but then when you want to take it off, like if you're detailing the car, if you're at a Cars and Coffee, a little car show, whatever it is, you can take it right off as well. And uh, it'll, it was like it was never there. So everyamp.com slash RTL on that. And I told you about my the conclusion of my budgetsafesolar.com experience. I have to say, in the end, they were super responsive to my wife and I, answered all our questions, and feel I, I genuinely feel good. I mean, there were some bumps in the road that were uh, mostly on the just red tape side of things, but I definitely felt the whole time like I had an, an advocate working for me and, and my wife in, in the form of Budget Safe Solar. Um, the, last, the last little hiccup I'm still working on as of this recording is just trying to get online with, with their uh, solar monitoring app. That's, that's proving to be a, a mildly annoying, like more annoying than it should be. But by and large, if I'm just being completely honest, I would recommend Budget Safe Solar. Again, you're going to check Tesla and check their solar because, you know, that's you you drive a Tesla or you're planning to drive a Tesla. So sure, you're going to do what I did and check Tesla solar first. And if their if their setup works for you, great. Then you're going to have solar and that's going to be awesome. But if it doesn't, just give them a look. That's all I ask. Budgetsafesolar.com uh, and use the referral code RTL if you do end up proceeding with an installation on your home or business. Sadly, the clock is ticking on this uh, this California Public Utility Commission thing here, here in California at least, where uh, the rules are going to change and the reimbursement you get from feeding energy back into the grid is gonna go way down. So uh, if you've been thinking about it and you're on the fence and you're in California, you, you might, you know, if you can swing it, Move now so you can hopefully get your system in before uh, before this this change happens and drastically reduces the amount of credit that you'll get from putting energy back into the grid. Meanwhile, if you're going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, bring your car over to Immaculate Reflections, and I promise you, you will love the car that comes back. And when you get that car back, it's going to look way better. Whether you're doing paint correction whether you're doing paint protection film, whether you're doing ceramic coating or some combination of those, there uh, is just, there's really no better place you could take your car than Immaculate Reflections. If you get a chance to see my car, you will see what Immaculate Reflections' work looks like. So uh, there is a discount waiting for you if you're a Ride the Lightning listener. So when you reach out, to inquire about booking work through the website, which is irdetailing.com. Just mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener, and when you book that that job, uh, you will get a nice little discount off of that service that you have booked. So thank you to Immacul- Immaculate Reflections for offering that. PureTesla.com slash RTL, your one-stop shop for your dash cam and sentry mode needs. They also have that nice slimline low profile wireless game controller kit takes up a little less space in your either your glove box or your center console so uh on the dash cam slash sentry mode front 49 dollars will get you the 128 gigabyte micro sd based kit still plugs in usb into your car because that's all your car has are usb ports so it is plug and play it's very easy free shipping anywhere in the u.s that's nice or a you know mild shipping fee if you're if they need to ship internationally to you. There's also a 256 gigabyte kit for sixty nine dollars. But quite honestly, like the 128 is probably gonna to probably gonna take perfectly good care of you. Check them out puretesla.com/rtl. At the top of the podcast, I mentioned the Patreon, which again my Patreon page is found at patreon.com/teslapodcast. Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. This is the way that you can choose to support my efforts here with Ride the Lightning if you so choose. This is a listener-supported podcast. The pledge tier start at just five bucks a month. Five bucks a month and you'll be supporting me here 
really helping me out. And in return for that five bucks a month, you will not only get the, what I hope is satisfaction for helping me out, but you'll get early access to each week's podcast as well. If you step up to the $10 a month tier, which I've labeled the ludicrous mode tier, that's where you get the early access and that weekly bonus lightning round mini episode as well. There are a couple of other tiers that keep going up higher with more and more stacking perks. So you can check all of that out on my Patreon page, which again is found at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. Follow slash subscribe to this podcast totally for free at any of the major podcast services, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and then audio only on YouTube. But if you'd like to listen there, just keep a browser tab open and have the podcast up on YouTube. You can do that by searching Ride the Lightning Tesla on YouTube. You'll find my channel and can subscribe easily from there. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, same handle on both, DMC underscore Ryan. My email address again, if you'd like to reach out to me for any reason, teslapodcast at gmail.com. And that'll bring me to just about the end. I just want to say hello and thank you to the upper tier Patreon backers and their uh, very extreme generosity. I'll start with the Maximum Plaid folks. They are Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from Las Vegas, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Watley, Eric Brown, Mark Eversole, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Mait Suaru, Derek Nesselrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Alex Brem, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody, Andre Kent, Joel Sapp, Kim Bay, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, We Drive Tesla EV Luxury Car Rental in Oahu, HaloBengals.com, Chris Pratt, Ken Epstein, Doug Carey, James Gregory, and Adam Lavoy. Next, the Roadster in Space tier backers. And a sincere thank you goes out to Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, Victoria Iacovetto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, and Carol Weston. Finally, the Plaid level supporters. Thank you very much to George Cassiopo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Jason Chalukas, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peak, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, the Tesla owners East Bay Club, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Travis Krenzel, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Jonathan Zelezny, Ish, not Elon Musk, in air quotes, T. Kirk Lowry, Peter, and the Bear Boys of Colorado. Well, that brings us to the end of an action-packed Ride the Lightning episode 394 for a snoozing Daisy the Boxer and an also snoozing Zelina the Future Service Dog. I'm Ryan McCaffrey. This was, again, episode 394. Happy electric motoring, my friends, and I will see you back here next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.